Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you like, you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. You can also donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking Donate. I'd also like to thank Dr. Bob Turner, who is my newest patron. I truly do appreciate it. I do this full-time, and every dollar you give helps keep all of it going. Don't forget, I have three other podcasts out there. From John to Justin, which releases every single Friday and looks at every single Prime Minister in Canadian history, I'm currently on Part 2, looking at every single opposition leader who never became Prime Minister. Canada's Great War releases on every Sunday, and it looks at Canada during the First World War, and Coast to Coast, which looks at the building of the Transcontinental Railway every single Thursday. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. And of course, if you enjoy the episode, please consider a five-star review. If you do a five-star review, I will thank you right on the air. And again, I truly appreciate it. It is one of the darkest chapters in the history of the Canadian West, but from that would come an iconic symbol of Canada. At the same time, the outlawed nature of the Wild West of America would be stopped, and sadly it all came about because of a slaughter of Indigenous people in the Cypress Hills in an event now known as the Cypress Hills Massacre. For centuries, the Cypress Hills have been an important meeting place for the Indigenous of the Canadian West. Today, it straddles the border between Alberta and Saskatchewan in the south, but long ago it was just a beautiful spot on the landscape. During the early Paleogene era, millions of years ago, as the Rocky Mountains were finishing their formation, they created rivers that deposited a sheet of sand and gravel across the area. In this semi-arid environment, giant tortoises lived because of the minimal freezing temperatures. Roughly 10 million years ago, an uplift began that eroded the surrounding gravel plain, leaving this remnant of an older landscape. When the Ice Age came, the top of the Cypress Hills was never covered by glacier ice, and this created an ecosystem similar to what's seen in the Rocky Mountains as a result. I used to live in southwest Saskatchewan, and I visited the Cypress Hills many times, and I have to say it's a magical place. Today, the land is covered in lodgepole pine forests, which were used by the indigenous for sleds and tent lodges. The Blackfoot called the land Ai Kim Ikui, which means striped earth or earth over earth, while the Cree called it Manataka, which means beautiful upland, while the Assiniboine called it Wazehe, and all these names show its importance as a meeting place. All of this had changed by the early 1870s. The bison were gone, the indigenous were being pushed to the reserves, and whiskey traders were coming up from the United States, upsetting the way of life of the indigenous. Along with whiskey, those traders would sometimes bring violence. During the early 1870s, small independent companies began to trade whiskey with the indigenous in the southwestern portion of the Northwest Territories, located in what would today be Alberta and Saskatchewan. The trade began with American fur traders who brought in whiskey as part of the fur trade. These strong and cheap liquors benefited the traders who were able to make better deals in the trade, but for the indigenous, the alcohol brought disease, poverty, and malnutrition. To capitalize on this as much as possible, small forts were set up by the Americans on Canadian soil. The most famous of these was Fort Whoopup, which was built in 1869 by John Healy. Officially serving as a trading post, the first fort would burn down within a year, and a second fort was built after at a cost of $25,000. Situated near to where Lethbridge is today, the traders would brew a drink called Whoop Up Bug Juice, an alcohol spiked with ginger, molasses, and red pepper. It was then colored black with chewing tobacco, watered down, and boiled. And while there was legal trading that occurred at the fort, the trade of alcohol with the indigenous was rampant. Other whiskey trading forts were set up including Robber's Roost at the junction of the Belly and Old Man River, Weather's Wax Post, Fort Spitzy near current High River, and another post in the Cypress Hills and one near Blackfoot Crossing. At the same time that whiskey traders were coming into Canada, wolf hunters were doing the same, wiping out massive populations of the species throughout the prairies. These hunters would kill bison, then poison the meat of the bison. 
At this point, they waited for wolves to eat the meat and die. The wolves would be skinned and bounties collected, amounting to $2.50 per hide. The dogs of the indigenous would often eat the meat and die, which added extra hardship to the indigenous who already dealt with the declining bison numbers. For the wolfers, they saw little issue with this. And it was in this environment that everything would change in 1873. In the spring of that year, a small party of wolfers led by Thomas Hardwick and John Evans were coming back through the area from their winter hunt. Camping near the Teton River, their horses disappeared in the night. The next morning, as they found their horses gone, the wolfers believed they had been stolen by the indigenous. About 40 of the horses had disappeared, and it's possible they had been taken by local Cree. But, for the wolfers, there was little difference between any indigenous, and they saw all indigenous as the same group. Believing that the indigenous had taken the horses over the border into Canada, they decided to set out to get their horses back. Walking on foot to Fort Benton in the Montana Territory, they were told by the authorities that they would not assist them, so Hardwick organized his own expedition to find the horses. A group of 13 men, including some Canadians, set out from the fort and travelled north. Eventually, they would reach the trading post of Abe Farwell, located in the Cypress Hills. Across the creek was the fort of Moses Solomon, and the Assiniboine in the area, who had dealt with a harsh winter and were low on food, liked Farwell, but they did not trust Solomon, who they said had cheated them. There were reports they even fired at his post. The Assiniboine had come from the north when one-third of their number had been wiped out by smallpox. While at the trading post, the Wolfers met George Hammond, a whiskey trader who was friends with Hardwick, and he quickly joined the group in pursuit of the horses. Farwell, for his part, told Evans and Hardwick that the local Assiniboine, led by a man called Little Soldier, had no horses with them. A quick search was conducted of the Assiniboine camp and the Wolfers' horses were not found. In the night, the Wolfers and whiskey traders began to drink whiskey with some Métis traders who had arrived, and Farwell remained sober as those around him drank, including Solomon. In the evening, the horse of Hammond would wander off. In the morning of June 1st, Hammond said that Little Soldier and his men had stolen his horse, and he began to travel to the camp of Little Soldier, telling the other Wolfers to follow him, which they did. Solomon also joined the march towards the indigenous camp, and according to one story of the massacre, Alex Lombardier, one of the Métis in the area, found Hammond's horse had only wandered away. He called towards the men as they rushed towards the Assiniboine camp, but it was too late. What happened next is up for debate as there's no reliable testimony from the next few hours. What is believed to have happened is that Farwell tried to restrain Hammond to prevent any violence, which he knew was coming. He was unsuccessful in stopping the men from proceeding to the camp, and Hammond then approached the tent of Little Soldier and asked him where his horse was. Little Soldier then said he had not stolen the horse and that it was grazing on a hill nearby. Little Soldier then offered two horses as hostages until Hammond's horse could be found. At this point, Hammond and his party saw the women and children leaving the camp and the men stripping off their garments, which they interpreted as a sign of impending battle. The wolfers quickly lined up at a riverbank 50 yards from the camp ready to fight. Farwell begged the wolfers not to start shooting, but instead of listening, Hammond fired his rifle, followed by the rest of the wolfers who fired a volley of bullets into the camp. The Assiniboine fired back, but their weapons were inferior and the wolfers were protected by the riverbank. The Assiniboine did manage to outflank the wolfers, forcing them to a high cut bank northwest of their position, but this didn't prevent the slaughter of the indigenous. By the end of the gunfight, Ed LaGrace, a wolfer, had been killed, while many Assiniboine were dead. The number's not known officially, but it's believed to at least be 20 people, or as many as 30. If 30 people were killed, likely twice as many were wounded. Some oral histories say it was as many as 300 people killed. LaGrace was buried in a wooden coffin that is still located somewhere at the site, while the Assiniboine were left on the ground with their bones dotting the landscape for years. According to some reports, the camp was rifled through and then burned by the wolfers. Some of the stories also relate that Little Soldier was killed and his head was put on a pike, while various women were assaulted by the wolfers. I couldn't confirm if either of these events happened, but that doesn't mean they didn't happen. But they could have become embellishments on the story amid anti-American anger following discovery of the massacre by those in eastern Canada later that year. <laughs> 
Another story of the battle states that Farwell had said he would negotiate to get two horses from the camp of Little Soldier, which Hammond would get until his horse was found. While he was negotiating with the Assiniboine, Hammond and the other men took up a position close to the camp, and as Farwell left, possibly to tell Hammond what had been agreed to, shots rang out from Hammond's position. In this story, Hammond had attempted to grab two horses from the camp, but he was stopped by an armed warrior, and Hammond returned to the other wolfers who all lined up ready to fight. The story also features a variation that Farwell, realizing what was about to happen, told the Assiniboine to scatter. It would be some time before news of the massacre reached Ottawa. It was first reported by Farwell to authorities in Montana, who then reported it to Washington. The Assiniboine had fled to a Métis camp nearby, and the Métis would relay the news of the massacre to Winnipeg. By August of 1873, news had reached Ottawa from both Winnipeg and Washington. And at first, it was believed that the massacre had occurred south of the Canadian border, but soon enough it was found that it was indeed in Canada, and the matter was referred to Ottawa. The Helena Herald ran a headline stating, quote, Whites on the warpath, 40 lodges wiped out by 16 Kit Carsons, end quote. As the news reached the rest of Canada, anti-Americanism reached a fever pitch in the new country. The newspapers described the Americans as gangsters and scums. The shock that Americans would commit the crime on Canadian soil angered many, even though Canadians had taken part in the massacre as well. Canadians in eastern Canada were led to believe that Americans would continually come into Canada to murder people. The newspaper reports tend to increase the scale of the slaughter as well, with the Manitoba Free Press reporting more than 40 were murdered in the massacre. On October 23rd, several political leaders in the Northwest Territories held a session where the main topic of discussion was the Cypress Hills Massacre. The purpose of the meeting was to address the, quote, danger of an Indian war and of an international complication which might embroil at any moment the British and American people, end quote. The government then began to take steps to have those who had committed the massacre extradited to Canada and tried for murder. Partially as a result of the massacre, the federal government would create the Northwest Mounted Police. It was not the only reason that the force was created, though. As far back as 1871, Captain W. F. Butler had been sent by Lieutenant Governor Archibald out into the Northwest Territories to assess the region's need for civil authority. He found that there was a need for it given the rampant American trading intrusion into the country. The massacre would help push the government into action on this recommendation. On September 25, 1873, an order in council was passed to appoint the first nine officers of the Mounted Police Force for the Northwest Territories. Recruitment soon began, and by 1874 the Mounties would begin their march west. At the site of the massacre, Fort Walsh would be built in 1875. It was at this fort that Man Who Takes the Coat, Long Lodge, and Lean Man signed Treaty 4. The creation of the Northwest Mounted Police was a political move on the part of the government as well. Through the investigation of the massacre, the government wanted to show the Indigenous that they could trust the Canadian government, which would aid the government in its treaty negotiations throughout the next decade in preparation for the arrival of the Transcontinental Railway. In fact, on Thursday, I'm actually talking about the treaty negotiations on my other podcast, Coast to Coast, so do check it out on all podcast platforms. In December of 1874, Northwest Mounted Police Assistant Commissioner James McLeod was given permission to enter Helena, Montana Territory to begin an investigation. Seven arrests were made, but two men escaped custody. The remainder of the men were freed because there was not enough evidence to prove they had taken any part in the massacre. The American government then refused to allow for extradition of the men, and instead McLeod was charged with false arrest, but these charges were dropped. In June of 1875, two traders and a wolfer crossed into Canada and were quickly arrested by the Northwest Mounted Police. In October of 1875, the Manitoba Free Press reported that three men were on trial for the murder of the Indigenous in the Cypress Hills in 1873, James Hughes, Philander Vogel, and George Bell. The newspaper would state, quote, We all recollect the shudder of the horror with which shortly after the bloody tragedy we received intelligence of the wanton and atrocious slaughter by a lawless band of whites, chiefly from Fort Benton, of the Assiniboine Indians peacefully encamped at the Cypress Hills, 
having no cause of offense and all unsuspecting any attack, and whose first intimation of danger was the sharp rattle of the deadly repeating rifle from a treacherous and concealed foe. End quote. During the trial, Farwell would give evidence against the Wolfers, just as he did previous year in Montana. Due to the lack of evidence, the case collapsed and the three men were acquitted, and by 1882 the case had been dropped completely. While the incident brought no charges, it pushed them for the creation of the Northwest Mounted Police, who then ensured the Americans stopped coming into Canada to trade illegally. In 1964, the site of the massacre was turned into a National Historic Site of Canada. Artifacts from the massacre are also found at the Fort Walsh National Historic Site. RCMP Commissioner Stuart Wood would be a major reason that the site would become a National Historic Site. According to his son, he spent years gathering evidence of the events of the massacre, which he used to place together the location of the trading post, the buildings, and the event that took place. He would also spend many days sifting through the dirt at various locations reported to be the massacre site. In the process, he found a bull chain, buttons, eyeglasses, and a gun. The massacre would be portrayed in The Canadians, a 20th Century Fox movie filmed near Maple Creek, close to the massacre site in 1960. In the movie, the Wolfers were replaced by a rancher and three hired men. Little is known about what happened to any of the Wolfers who committed the massacre, but Farwell would continue to live in the Cypress Hills area and carried mail for the Northwest Mounted Police between Fort McLeod and Fort Benton. He would eventually re-enter the trading business, setting up a post near a creek that now carries his name in the Cypress Hills. I hope you enjoyed that episode and my look at the terrible Cypress Hills Massacre. If you did, please leave a rating and review. Next week, I'm going to be looking at George Copway. If you like, you can reach me through email at craig at canadaehx.com. You can also visit my website where you'll find hundreds of articles on Canada's history as well as all my podcast episodes. Just go to CanadaEHX.com. And don't forget you can support the podcast through Patreon. There are multiple tiers to choose from, all with great benefits. You can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just like all of these wonderful patrons have, and I apologize if I mispronounce any names. Randy Hayden Doug Campbell Reg W Deborah Carlson Francis Helbling Random McCallum Diane Wade, Laurie Ann Kirby, Gary Dolovich, Nick Zinri, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Chauve, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Rawa, Luke Guess, J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. If you want, you can find me on Facebook. Just go to facebook.com slash CanadianHistoryX. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D. And you can find me on Instagram. Just go to Bairdo37. Information comes from Scenic Geology of Canada, Canadian Encyclopedia, North American Roots, Wikipedia, Manitoba Free Press, From Sage to Timber, The Early West, Strange Empire, History of Saskatchewan and the Old Northwest, Maple Creek and Area, The University of Saskatchewan, and The Toronto Star. Thanks. We'll see you again next time.